<laughs> Hello, my name is Ellen Gear. I'm the artistic director of the Will Gear Theatricum Botanicum that has been in business doing the arts, theater, and education for over 40 years. That is my grandson. His name is Julius Tyrone, and it must be from the O'Neill play. He is the fourth generation of the gears here at uh, Theatricum Botanicum. Oh, really, in, like, in the 70s is when we started, and we got our first union contract in the 80s. And uh, this is my daughter, who is now, Hi. she I'm was that gear. size, that size when she started, and now she's this size and one of our leading ladies. <laughs> I'm Willow Gear. I'm one of the actors here and company member for many years. I've worked in development. I've worked as a camp counselor and an educator to a, a lot of the children and adults and babies <laughs> that come through this, these walls, and we teach Shakespeare to all of them. It's a family business. <laughs> Sit here. It's the time. I remember, and I have it in a book, uh, my father, Will Gear, who is the founder of the place, said, uh, Ellen, you're going to have many love affairs in your life, but you'll never have one like Shakespeare. And he was right, because I would go from, to colleges with him, and he would say, do a little Viola, do a little Juliet, you know, and I'd have to be ready for these things. And I, uh, that was my beginning with Shakespeare, and uh, I've loved him ever since. And he works beautifully on this great big outdoor stage. He had to find a place. Wait, hold on, let me get Ruining his He's beautiful singing. story. He's singing. <laughs> Start again with that, Mom. It's too important. To All right. In, in the 50s, my father was blacklisted uh, uh, with the House on American Activities Committee. And uh, my mother found this place that we sort of went into hiding uh, while those years went by. And during those years, we had something called the Gear Gardens. And the Gear Gardens, we made our living by selling herbs and plants. And we had all the Shakespeare plants and all the quotes. Because Pop had written a book that proved Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare by uh, some of the country names that happened in Stratford. And he would put them in this book. It's quite a wonderful thing. And now it's grown. After his passing on, we, we decided as a family and uh, the other artists to make this thing continue and to make education as important as performing before the audiences because the most important thing is to pass on these great stories and the great techniques of elevated language that you need to really be a sound, wonderful actor. And uh, my daughter, Willow Veer, is an example. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of hard for me because I was kind of thrown into this at first. <laughs> it's like, why pay babysitter, put her in the play? Um, I was a fairy, it's my dream when I was a baby. I was, I think my first speaking role was Mamilius in A Winter's Tale. Um, I had this really funny little wig, what was I, six? And it just was a part of me and who I was and just what I did growing up all the way until it got to be college time and I was like, oh, what am I gonna do? I guess I'll be an actor because that's just what I've been doing. And um, at my school, there was a teacher there whose name was Milan Dragisvich, and he actually taught here a lot and did a lot of shows here. And um, he came in for one semester, and I just happened to be the lucky class that got him. And he taught rhetoric in a way that while I had always adored Shakespeare, um, just because it was almost like growing up with a second language, his excitement about the language and how to use rhetorical devices to make it come alive and hearing the music of it and how saying it one way is just more right than saying it another way or makes it more palatable for our ears. Um, that was one of my more meaningful moments of Shakespeare where I fell in love with it for what it was as an adult rather than just kind of loving it as a kid because that's just what you do. Oh, it's made me a much better human being. Because in order to do him well, you have to climb into each character's shoes and understand them and not make them your enemy, even if they are an enemy within the text. And uh, that, to me, it's, it, it's like, you know, I mean, we as a country went through this thing and maybe we're still going through it, psychiatry. I think if you really study Shakespeare, you can understand the human condition. Uh, because he, he talks about religion, he talks about the environment, he talks about politics, everything that, that exists that w is in our framework as human beings. 
And if you really delve into it, his lines, it, it makes you a better human being. Shakespeare has kind of been my life. <laughs> I was raised in it, so it's everything to me in that respect. It's my family, it's my livelihood, it's my, most of my friendships came from this theater because I grew up in it, so all of us have this deep, dorky love for language and Shakespeare. Um, so in that way, it's really influencing, but also who I am, a lot of what you were just saying about all the different people you get to be and how incredibly full each character is. Even the evil ones have their, their parts that you understand and you, can, you find that ugly part in yourself that you can bring out and go, oh yeah, well I can, I can find empathy with that person and why they would feel that way. Even the most awful characters, you've, you can understand where they're coming from. And I think that that is a, such an important quality of the human being. Also, the educational part, I know, you know, teaching kids Shakespeare is such an amazing opportunity, and I've gotten to do that so much. And seeing the light in someone's eye when they go, oh, I get it, <laughs> you know? And watching these little kids who, whose parents say, oh, there's no way my you know, five-year-old, I teach three to six-year-olds, and by the end of the class, they learn Bottoms monologue, and they, they, some of them learn Mark Antony and Hamlet, and here they are, this like little kid saying these lines, and they understand what it means, and they... They are excited about the language and nobody is too young for it. I think it just gets a bad rap because there's a lot of people who don't know how to do it well. So it gets boring and it's not, it's so full of life. And so it's been everything that I am. I use Shakespearean words in my everyday language sometimes <laughs> because I'm doing a play and suddenly I, or I'll make up my own word and say ah well Shakespeare did it why can't I make up my own word <laughs> um, he's just a, a beautiful and great poet and I feel very grateful to have had him so incredibly entwined in my existence it's the the passion that you have to put into it I think Americans have a great facility for the passion that Shakespeare needs it's the techniques. You must know the techniques. I taught for about 15 years at UCLA, and I was working in a school that, that had never really touched those techniques. And sometimes, uh, you know, other people would say, my actors are coming in and they're using these high notes and these low notes, and you know, because uh, we as Americans speak in a monotone. Well, all we have is down endings. You can hear it now. And uh, that is an impossible thing to do when you're doing Shakespeare. There's a wonderful buoyancy. It's a ball that you pass back and forth to each other as actors. And you must get this skill. Uh, very often people say, why can't you talk faster? No, no, it's not talking faster. It's how you throw that ball to each other with your operative words and uh, understanding how to win the argument that Shakespeare has placed in front of you. Well, her answer was so good. Um, <laughs> I, I think like whenever I go to England and I go to the Globe or the Royal Shakespeare Theater or whatever and you watch these plays and it doesn't take you as long for your ear to click in because you know there's always those first couple scenes, even me who have just listened to Shakespeare my whole life, it takes a second for your ear to click over and go, okay, now I can understand everything. and there you just it just happens quicker you understand things like that there are some of the fool's lines that i'll hear in a play over there that i've never understood before and it's not that they're saying it quick faster it's not that they're acting better it's just their technical ability to highlight certain words so that my ear can catch it because it's just so much information packed into one line that like you're just overwhelmed so you stop listening is what I think happens to a lot of people when they listen to Shakespeare done by somebody who doesn't quite uh, have the technique for it. But if you hear it done by somebody who knows how to pick which words to highlight in which, which way or use all the different kinds of um, poetry devices that Shakespeare uses in, in a way that your ear just wants it, the same way you listen to a pop song and you have this feeling of, I think you literally release oxytocin when you hear pop music because of the resolution and your brain knows what it's going to do or you've already memorized the, the, the chorus. And so that happens with Shakespeare when it's done well. You know exactly where they're going and then when it ends it's like 
you literally do release some kind of chemical in your brain that goes, oh, I know that's where it's going to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, I think when it's done well like that, that's how it makes you masterful. Oh, hateful hands to tear such loving words. Injurious wasps to feed on such sweet honey and kill the bees that yielded with your sting. I'll kiss each several paper for amends. <laughs> Look, here is writ, kind Julia. Unkind Julia. As in revenge to thy ingratitude, I throw thy name against the bruising stones, trampling contemptuously on thy disdain. Here is writ, love wounded Proteus, poor wounded name. My bosom as a bed shall lodge thee till thy wounds be thoroughly healed. And thus I search it with a sovereign kiss. Mm. But twice or thrice was Proteus written down. Be calm, good wind. Blow not a word away till I have read each letter in the letter. Except my own name. That's some whirlwind bear unto a ragged, fearful, hanging rock and throw it thence into the raging sea. Lo! Here in one line is his name twice writ. <laughs> Poor, forlorn Proteus. Passionate Proteus, <laughs> to the sweet Julia, well, that I'll tear away. Yet I will not sit so prettily. He couples it to his complaining names. Thus will I fold them one upon another. Now kiss, <laughs> embrace, <laughs> contend, oh, do what you will. <laughs> King Lear. We did a Queen Lear because it's a story about an older person who makes a huge mistake, uh, giving away her things while she's still alive and having not been really a, an extraordinary mother because she was too busy doing her work running a kingdom. The result was kids who, who left her heart. Oh, you heavens, give me patience. Patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old woman, full of grief as age wretched in both, if it be you, that have stirred these brothers' hearts against their mother. Fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger. And, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my cheeks. Oh, you unnatural whelps! I will give you such revenges that all the world shall... I will do such things that what they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. Oh, you think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. This heart of mine will break into a hundred thousand shards, or ere I weep. Oh, oh fool, I shall go mad. Oh.